folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of prophetic research ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. I'm going to start out today, I'm going to play a little trick, we're going to play a little game uh, to sort of set you up for, for what I'm going to show you today. Uh, from a child, I always wanted to be a, a magician, I wanted to do magic tricks, I wanted to have a magic show. And then, you know, I thought maybe I can do magic tricks and then teach the gospel. And I thought, well, maybe that's not the best way in the world uh, to teach the gospel. And I never was good at it. I, I stink at magic. I, I, I know a few card tricks that I can do. I can palm a coin. But other than that, I, I just, you know, I get nervous and I tip my hand and all kinds of things. And when you're going to be a magician, you got to really be really smooth and you got to be easy going. But I, I learned, I learned some of the tricks. I learned some of the things that magicians do. I've watched magicians all my life. Doug Henning and David Copperfield and David Blaine, the street magician. And there's another guy by the name of Darren Brown. He's actually a magician slash mentalist. He does mental magic. And this really fascinates me. And I've been kind of telling some people over the last year that I've been doing some amazing studies. And some of that is going to come out today. Uh, but I'm, I, I want us to play a little game. So what, what I need you to do is I need you to get a, a piece of paper, a pen, or a pencil. Now, I'll, I'll stand here and wait patiently while you do that. Of course, you can just press pause and, and go get your piece of paper and pencil because I'm going to have you draw some very, very simple shapes. And I'm going to try to guess at what you're going to draw. So I'll wait while you get your paper and pencil. Okay, that should be long enough. All right, now here's what I want you to do. Uh, we're going to go all the way back to the f to first grade geometry. We're going to we're gonna just going to draw and picture in our minds some very very simple shapes. So I want you to I want you to imagine that between you and I there's a there's a screen, okay, like a rectangular screen here, and uh, on that screen we're going to place a very simple first grade geometry object. Uh, think of something sort of like uh, sort of like a square but not a square. And I want you to put that image on that screen. Now the second thing I want you to do is I want you to think of another object that sort of surrounds that first object uh, that you put on our imaginary screen. Okay, if you got it, and I want you to write that down. Okay, and I'm going to give you five, four, three, two, one. Now, if this is the object that you drew on your paper, then my little trick Work. You see, I didn't actually, I didn't actually read your mind. I didn't actually guess uh, what you were going to write on there. If you wrote what I put up here, then I made you draw that down. I made you write that thing down. How? How did I? Am I magic? No, it's a trick. Now, if you didn't happen to write down what I put up on the screen, then you know why I'm not out doing magic tricks everywhere. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the more it's done, the better the results. And I don't go around doing this very often, but, but some people do. Magicians do it. It's, the, the technique is called a force, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit uh, later on. It's, it's called a force. I actually, if you wrote down the uh, triangle inside of a circle, then it's because I forced you to, to draw and to picture that particular image. I'll show you how I did it here in a little bit. Um, but anyway, um, it's called a force. Magicians will force people to do certain things, to pick a certain card. Magi Some magicians are really good at making you pick the, the exact card that they want you to pick. You don't know that they're doing it. It's going on subliminally, with, without your awareness. Uh, they can make you pick a card. They can make you draw a shape. They can make you reach a conclusion that you may not be aware that they're even actually leading you to that conclusion. I mentioned that some people are pretty good at this. Some people do this a lot. Magicians do it a lot. Politicians do it a lot. You listen to speeches that they make, gestures. Did you know that, that high-level politicians will pay somebody in the tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars to show that politician exactly how to speak, how to make certain hand gestures, how to do this, how not to do this. It's all about image, things that you don't necessarily uh, are, are aware that you're seeing, 
but things that you're seeing. Politicians do it. Speeches they make. Words that they use. Expressions that they come across with. It's all very visual. It all goes into our mind. And a lot of times we're not even aware that it's going on. Let me tell you who else does it. Advertisers. Now, this, this goes all the way back when I, when, I was, um, when I was a teenager. Advertisers, people in the media, m- uh, movies, music. I remember back in the 80s that we had a guy in our church years ago that was doing seminars on rock music. And he was doing th- things, and I've, we've done this uh, on a video, and I may do some more. Uh, subliminal messages in music, backward masking, and there's actually support for this. It, it, I'm telling you, it works. Okay. Um, over time, I'm probably going to present more of this information in future Watchman video broadcasts, but I'm going to focus on something that one of our watchers sent to us. But uh, m- musicians and Hollywood producers, film producers, TV commercials, um, uh, all throughout, and I, I'm not going to show you examples of some of the magazine ads that are out there and have been around there for like the past 40 years, because in many cases, a lot of magazine ads, especially the full page ones where you're flipping through a magazine, you look at the bottle of vodka and you just keep going. They've a- you've actually done what the advertisers wanted you to do because your subconscious mind picked up on an object picked up on something that they implanted into that ad that triggers something in your brain that leads you to a conclusion or associates their product with something that they planted in your mind. Subliminal advertising is, is it, everybody does it, okay? Commercials are done, the TV commercials are done this way. Movies are done this way. Uh, advertising, uh, TV shows are done this way, and I'm going to show you a clip or a, or a frame of a television show that came on last television season called The Event. You're going you're gonna to like this. But let me, uh, let me show you how this works. Now, back in the 80s, it used to be called subliminal suggestion or subliminal advertising. They now have a new, new name for it. It's called perception without awareness. Perception without awareness. There's something, I, I, I do want you to do this, and this is not really a trick, but I want you to get what I'm talking about here. You hold your hand out in front of you like this, and you look at, you look at your, your five fingers, okay? Now, take your other hand and put it right here along the side of your head. Can you see your hand? If you're staring at your hand here, can you see your hand waving over here? I can, okay? Now, that is, in the, uh, that is part of my eyesight that uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to, but my eye is able to pick up what's going on over here. Okay, this is my mind perceiving an image or an object or something going on over here that I'm not necessarily focused on, but my mind is picking up in any way. Let me show you an example of this, and you can YouTube uh, search this guy's name is Darren Brown. He is a uh, he's a British uh, magician and mentalist, and he has a TV show and he does all these tricks with people, and he brings people to the conclusion that he wants them to bring. This one really fascinated me. He got my attention. What he did was he went into a mall and he set up throughout this mall uh, mannequins and store displays and things that as we walk up and down the mall, we normally don't pay a whole lot of attention to. We don't really, we see it but we don't really see it, but it goes into our mind anyway. In some of the store displays, he always featured mannequins, uh, one mannequin holding out a large sum of money to another, giving them, uh, giving money away. I want you to notice in this particular graphic here that there's a large amount of money being given to someone who's wearing this old sock cap and an old coat. Okay, so it sort of looks like a homeless guy. Um, store displays, signs in the windows that says giveaway and things like that. Massive giveaway. Way. Then the magician, Darren Brown, dressed up in an old sock cap, an old coat, uh, put on a beard, made himself real scraggly looking. He looked like a street person, a, a bum, that we would call him, uh, a homeless person. And he sits there at the, at the entrance to this mall or the exit to this mall. He sits there and he is, he is begging for money. Within the space of an hour, he took in almost 350 British pounds in the space of one hour because he had implanted in people's minds over here on the side where we're not really paying attention to, not really focus on them, 
But over here on the side, these images were going into their brain. People handing out money. A huge, massive giveaway. One guy, I, I, when I saw this, I couldn't believe it. One particular store, it was a shoe store, he had written across the front window, walk your way to a better soul, S-O-L-E, which is like the soul of a shoe. And then featured in the window is a mannequin sort of presenting a shoe, giving, giving a shoe. Walk your way to a better soul. In other words, giving the idea that, um, oh, if you do some things, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you feel better in your soul. One guy actually, while Darren Brown was sitting there, dressed like a, a homeless person, one guy actually came over to him, started to give him money, sat down next to him, took off his shoes and his socks, and gave them to the magician, the mentalist. It works. And there are numerous, you can YouTube Mental Magic, Darren Brown, there are others there. You can watch the videos. You can see what it is they're doing. And I'm telling you, advertisers know this. Musicians know how to do this. Um, magazine ads, TV commercials, they know how to do this. When you walk up and down the aisle of the, of the store that you go to, Remember I've been telling you that there's a reason why they've been changing all of the logos of the products that you and I are used to? There's a reason why. And I strongly suspect it has everything to do with this idea called perception without awareness. It's, it's planting an idea in the subconscious of our mind, in the deep, deep places of our mind, planting an idea that at some point is going to give birth to something that you do, something that you say, or a decision that you're going to make. We even use, the, and not using this terminology, we even use the term of, this is something that I conceived of in my mind. We're using language that describes the very thought process I'm talking about. We're using language like, I conceived of this idea. That is a term used in the scriptures, by the way, a term that gives us the idea that something has been conceived and then later it's going to give birth. Let me, let me give you a passage of scripture here. The Bible says, when lust hath conceived, you see, lust is a thought, okay? When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You may have heard me talk about this passage before, especially that phrase, it is finished. Because those three words just happen to be the exact same words that, that Jesus said when, when he was on the cross. Therefore, when lust hath conceived, it starts with a thought, sometimes even in the subconscious realm of our mind. And remember, this idea of contemplative prayer, they want you to shut down the conscious part of your mind and just go into the subconscious so that thoughts can be conceived, so that you can hear what they call, quote unquote, the voice of God. There was a movie that came out last year. I saw this movie because I had a feeling that something was up with it. It was called Inception. I've, I've watched this movie now uh, about two or three times so that I can really get the gist of what's going on. You really have to focus on what's being said and what's being told inside some of these. You see, if you focus on them and you think about them, then the object or the idea of what they're presenting becomes a whole lot clearer. It doesn't just go into your subconscious. It's actually there and you can analyze it and say, okay, I don't want anything to do with that. And I want you to keep that in mind. Because even though we walk around and through ads, through, through billboards, through signs, things are being planted inside of our subconscious, we actually have a conscious, rational brain that can make a decision and say, you know what, I, I don't, that's wrong, I don't want anything to do with it, or I'm not going to make that decision, or I'm not going to come to that conclusion. We actually have the ability to override that. But this movie Inception was about Oh, this, this sort of organization that had the ability, these people had the ability to go inside people's dreams and they could actually manipulate people in their dreams. They could be part of people's dreams. And there was one, this uh, Japanese corporation, this guy that owned this big uh, 
powerful Japanese corporation, had a business competitor, and he wanted Leonardo DiCaprio to go inside of his mind, and his business competitor was really giving it to him, and he wanted his competitor to take his company that his father was giving him and break it up into little pieces so it wouldn't be a threat to him. DiCaprio says it can be done, but what we have to do is we have to go down not only in his dream state, we have to actually go in below that. He has to go in, and, and this was interesting, because he said we have to go in four levels into his dream state, in a level that is, is nobody has ever gone before, and we need to plant an idea sort of like a seed. Are you, are you getting the language here? We need to plant a seed of a thought so that when he awakens, he's not aware that this thing has been planted inside of him and he will decide to break up his company and, and fulfill the, the result of what this guy was asking him to. And the, the interesting thing is, is that these, these four layers of dreams, uh, I want you to remember that number four because we're going to see that here in a little bit. Um, it's interesting that the, uh, the poster, they, they released a, a poster and an ad poster for this movie, for the movie called Inception. You see uh, the word Inception. You see the, what looks like a head, and then there's another head inside of it, and another one inside of that one, and, an, and a fourth one inside of that. And you see the little maze imagery here that's called a labyrinth, and we've talked about that before, and, and uh, I think that idea is very interesting as well. There is actually... And I'm not going to draw your attention to it, but I probably already have. But there is actually a subliminal suggestion or a perception without awareness technique actually embedded into this movie poster. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to describe what it is. But it's right there, and it's meant to trigger a response on your part. This whole idea of perception without awareness, uh, you, you know me, everything, everything that's going on out here in the world, I, I see it as this is that which is taught to us in the scriptures. And I started thinking about how, they, of course, the Bible doesn't use the word subliminal. But the phrase perception without awareness is interesting to me because the Bible uses the word unawares unawares Galatians chapter 2 verse 4 and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage you know what Paul do you know what Paul was describing he was describing a conspiracy because there are brethren more than one He's describing a conspiracy where people, false brethren, they're not real brothers. Is that still going on today? Are, are we still living in a time in the church age where there are people who say they're Christians, but they're not really Christians? Okay, False brethren were brought in, how? Unawares, in the peripheral, Okay, peripheral vision. They're, they're over here, and we don't really notice them. We're not really paying attention to them, but we're picking on, up on some very, very subtle things that they're doing. This idea of perception without awareness has to do with subtlety. Darren Brown went through this mall, and he decorated windows so that there were suggestions everywhere that people ought to hand out money to someone wearing a sock cap and his old coat and you know massive giveaway and walk your way to a better soul and here's money and here's shoes and he was actually planting these very subtle ideas now something for you to think about and consider is that there is actually a, a character in the bible whose only method of operation is to work subtly. His name was the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which means that he never, he never planted his ideas and his concepts in your mind straight on. It was always done in the peripheral, on the side, with just the bare limits of your perception going in, not through the focal point of your mind, but through the subconscious levels of your mind, planting subtle ideas and subtle images in people's minds to bring them to a conclusion. Now, Bible Christianity is the exact opposite of that. You see, we don't use subtlety. We don't have to use words of man wis man's wisdom. 
We don't have to come up with uh, private ways of, of sharing our information. And if you ever go to like a religious conference or you're in a church or, or, or whatever, or some religious meeting or whatever, and you perceive that they're trying to give you very subtle hints and subtle ideas, they probably are not preaching the real gospel. Paul, the, the Apostle Paul talks about the foolishness of preaching is what saves mankind. We don't use man's wisdom. We don't use the devil's subtlety. We don't do anything like that. We preach it plainly. I can tell you that you are a sinner. You're in danger of hellfire. Jesus died on the cross for your sins to save you from that hell if you believe the Bible and accept Jesus as your Savior, confessing your sins. If you call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. That's the end of it right there. Now, there's wonderful doctrines that are contained in this Bible, but they're all right there in front of us. Easy to see, easy to read. But the devil always likes to operate on the peripheral, on, the, on, the, on just sort of the sidelines where we don't really notice what's going on. And Paul was talking about in these Galatian churches, false brethren came in unawares to spy out our liberty so that they might bring us back into bondage. Unawares. Jude warned us about these guys as well. In Jude verse 4, the Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that they operate on the peripheral, just sort of barely within our notice. And uh, again, go, go to YouTube or go to any place where they host videos. Uh, the Discover Channel has a show that they uh, air every now and then called Deception with Keith Berry. He does pretty much the same thing. He gets, he gets things going on over here and then leads the person to the conclusion that he brought them to subtly. Now, I'm going to make this very plain for you because I believe in the simplicity of the gospel. The Bible declares that you are a sinner. The Bible declares that Jesus is the Savior. What's your decision? I'm not going to try to slick you into a decision. I'm not going to try to bring you into that subtly. I'm just going to plainly ask you, do you want Jesus to be your Savior? Do you want to die and go to heaven? Or will you reject Christ and spend eternity in hell? See, it's that simple. And you make the decision on what you want to do. And I'm not going to stand here and beg. I'm just going to tell you that's how it is. But the devil has a plan. He has an operation. He has something he wants to get across to people. And he's never going to tell them straightforward. Albert Pike, uh, somebody was asking me the other day about my copy of Morals and Dogma. And they said, where can you get that one? It's the esoteric one, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's what it says, esoteric version. And they said, well, there's two versions of morals and dogma. There's one that's real, real secret. It's got all the secret stuff in it. One does it. And I said, I've read this one. And I can tell you in over 800 pages of Albert Pike's morals and dogma, the esoteric version of it, they never said what the secret was. They alluded to it. They hinted at it. They symbolized it, allegorized it. They walked all the way around it, but they never came out and told you what the secret was. That's why I had to go to the King James Bible to find out what it was, because God speaks plainly so that we can understand. And so we understand, we need to understand this idea that the devil is always going to try to plant very subtle ideas, bringing them in. And so that our minds perceive them without our awareness and understand that it's going on. One of our watchers sent me a video clip and they said, Pastor Mike, guess what I saw? And I, saw, I looked at it and I was just, as you British people say, I was gobsmacked at what I saw. This is from the TV show called The Event. And I'm just going to show you the clip here, just a, just a screen capture of it, okay? There are some subliminal things or things that they want you to perceive without your awareness. And I watched this particular episode. In fact, I watched every episode of the event. It was a TV series on last year. And I want you to understand this. It's, it's another one of these things we talked about uh, that features uh, aliens. And uh, there are uh, humans and they have mingled together. And now there's aliens and humans and they're hybrids. 
And there's lots of other things that are going on, and I'll explain some of them as, as we move along. But it only lasted one season. And at the last episode... They show you that the aliens are bringing their world, in fact, literally their whole planet, the last scene that you see is their planet coming through a portal and being right next to the planet Earth. Okay, And then the series is over. It's done. They said, well, the ratings were bad and this and that and the other. Well, maybe okay. Well, I saw this particular episode, never saw what this person pointed out to me until they pointed it out to me. Now that I know that it's there, I can look at it and see it every time. I want you to look here again. I want you to look at it because, number one, you see, uh, it looks like someone's looking into a car, and there's a car window, and you see a person uh, sort of on the bottom of the screen there. That is, uh, let me tell you who that is. Well, now, let, let me wait for a minute. I'll tell you who that is in a minute. But I want you to notice that there are letters written across the top of the, uh, of the car window. You see the letters I-N-R-I. -I. Do you see them? The letters I-N-R-I. -I. Now, like I said, I, I saw this episode, didn't really pay attention to it. Now I see it. I can see it every time. And I just happen to know what those letters are and, and what, they, what they represent. Uh, you probably recognize these as, as letters that you would see on top of a, uh, of a crucifix, on top of a cross with the, the image of, of Jesus there hanging on the cross. You see the letters I-N-R-I. Now, the, the Roman Catholic uh, explanation of these letters is that that represents the initials in Latin of Jesus of Nazareth, Rex Judeorum, or King of the Jews. But something that you need to understand about symbols um, is that, remember what Albert Pike said. Albert Pike said, okay, if we have a symbol and we tell you what the symbol means, we lied about it. We're, we're not really telling you the truth on what this symbol means. So you need to understand that. And I, I've done a little research on this, on this particular symbol, and, and I know for a fact that something is not right here simply because of one main thing. And that is, here we have a cross, and a lot of times you see them either in stone or in silver or gold or something really flashy. And then you have an image of what looks like Jesus Christ, but it's not. It's not Jesus. And how do I know that? Because they say it's Jesus. They say that this is Christ and Him crucified. My problem is, number one, um, we have a cross in our church. It doesn't have a dead guy hanging on it because the religion that we have does not, does not worship the dead guy. It worships the one who raised or was, was, was risen from the dead. We worship the risen Jesus Christ. So number one, we don't have like a dead guy. That would be creepy. Ugh. Uh, but number two, uh, this is an idol. This is an idol. This is not the real Jesus. This is an idol Jesus. This is not the real shepherd. This is the idol shepherd. Zechariah chapter 11 verse 17. Woe to the idol, I-D-O-L, shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and his, upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So we go back to this image here of this, of this idol. So we know that that's not Jesus. So we know that those letters there, I-N-R-I, must mean something other than what they tell you that they mean. So let's look around. I remember from research years ago, Alberto Rivera, a former Jesuit priest, came out with some shocking information that I've since found out a lot of things that he said that I know for a fact to be true. And that is, number one, the Jesuits used the letters. In fact, I, wanted to, I want you to look at it. Let's, let's talk about the Jesuits for a minute. The Jesuits are a sort of like the paramilitary CIA. I want you to remember that I said that. CIA of the Vatican. They are the Pope's army. In fact, they don't really answer to the Pope, you know, like Pope John Paul II or Pope Benedict. They actually answer to a higher authority than the Pope. He's referred to as the Black Pope. He's the Jesuit 
general. They, the Jesuits were started by Ignatius de Loyola, and Ignatius de Loyola, Loyola wanted an army. He wanted an army of very well-trained, very well-disciplined Roman Catholic priests. And in order to train them and discipline them well, they had all of these what they called spiritual formation exercises. We've talked about this before. Spiritual exercises such as going into deep, deep meditation. In some cases, these priests were, were said to have been able to levitate because of the power of the familiar spirits that were in them. But these guys, these guys had power and they played dirty. They were mean. There's an idea that goes around if you study anything about the Jesuits and, and their workings. Their, their job was to, uh, if they didn't like a particular king or a particular uh, political system or a particular religious system, their job was to infiltrate it secretly, s subtly, coming in unawares to bring them back into the bondage of the Roman Catholic Church. And there's this idea floating around countries that uh, once the Jesu Jesuits... They, they've been practically kicked out of every nation they've ever been in, except, of course, America. But anyway, they've been kicked out, and the Jesuits have this idea that uh, once you tell us to leave, be sure that we're coming back. We, we are going to come back. We're going to get revenge. They don't like to take no for an answer. They're, they're pretty nasty people. The Jesuits have a, have a symbol. You know, everybody's got to have a symbol. Now, the Jesuits have a symbol. And I want you to look at this particular symbol because it's a circle. And it had all the, has all these lines coming out of it. Now, that circle would probably represent the sun. You've seen this before. But the number of lines, I, I actually counted them. And there's 32 rays coming out of this sun thing in the middle. Of course, the sun would be the 33rd point. You remember the Japanese flag, the old Japanese flag, still used by the Japan Navy, by the way. It features the exact same symbol, the sun in the center with 32 rays coming out of it. And we see also the CIA symbol. It's that compass rose. The compass rose has this little point in the middle, what they call, here, here we go, what they call the center point. Okay, uh, Churches named center point or cross point or grace point or anything like that. That's where this is derived from. It's derived from this idea of the compass rose where you have a point in the middle that is, is the intersection of four lines. Okay, And usually there's 32 lines that are coming out of this thing. It happens to be the same logo for the American Central Intelligence Agency. Remember the, the Vatican, remember the Jesuits, they were sort of like the CIA of the Vatican. It's just interesting to me that they um, seem to be using the, the, all the same idea. This number 33, of course, is seen in Freemasonry. Uh, you have it as the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And I want you to understand, and we've talked about this before in a video called Chaos. If you don't have that, get a copy from us. But the, the slogan for the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry says, Ordo ab chao, which means order out of chaos. And I just, I just happened to look that word up one day to see what the word chaos meant. It means the abyss, the pit, the prison. I, I want you to think about that because they're telling you that order is, is in prison right now. And it's going to be brought up out of, out of the pit, out of the abyss, out of prison. Keep that in. I, I'm telling you this. I'm not trying to do it subtly, but I want you to remember that I said this. This number 33 points us to the cross because we know by the scriptures that Jesus was 33 years old when he died on the cross. But why was he 33 years old? Well, the number three has to do with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus took on the sins of the entire world upon him, but namely a particular entity the Bible refers to as the man of Sin. You see, everything about Jesus and the cross, it was real, but it was also packed with biblical symbolism. God is trying to tell you what Jesus was doing. Jesus was actually crucifying his enemies, killing his enemies in his death, just like Samson did.
And so here is Jesus, 33 years old on the cross. And how are these enemies portrayed in the scriptures? We go back to the book of Joshua. We find out that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the wilderness, that Moses actually killed two kings in the process. One Sion, king of the Amorites. The other one was Og, king of Bashan, who just happened to be a, a giant. He was a, he was a hybrid. He was part alien and, and part human, part angel and part human. That's who Og was, part of the sons of God, daughters of men thing in Genesis chapter 6. And here is Og, and he is one of the two kings that Moses killed. And then Joshua, after Moses died, Joshua kept on fighting. And the whole list in Joshua chapter 12 of the kings that Joshua killed as they moved into Canaan land. There was 31 of those. You see, 31 plus 2, that's 33. These two men, Moses and Joshua, representing the Old Testament and the New Testament, the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ, killed the 32, 33 kings that were inhabiting the promised land so that God's people could move in. Are you getting where we're going here? And then we have the story in 1 Kings chapter 20. We have Ben Hadad, the king of the, the king of Syria, who gathered all of his hosts together. Host is usually an angel word in the Bible. And there were 30 and two kings with him. We have 32 kings, and then we have one. We have a, a point in the middle, a center point, and we have 32 rays around that point. And you see the symbolism here. That's 33, and that's who Jesus defeated on the cross. This number 33 is always associated with the beast. In fact, in the New Testament of the King James Bible, that exact phrase, the beast, is mentioned exactly 33 times. Let's get back to the Jesuits. The Jesuits use these letters I-N-R-I. Now, I actually have a much simpler explanation than this, and I'll show it to you, because I think, I like for things to be simple, and I don't really understand Latin and anagrams and all this stuff, but anyway, here's what the, um, the, uh, the, the letters I-N-R-I mean to the Jesuit. It's Latin for justum necar regis impius, which means it is just to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. In other words, if we don't like the uh, if we don't like the president, uh, we're going to take him out. If we don't like the government, we're going to replace it. If 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 they do not bow to Rome, if they do not give way to the Vatican, to the Holy Mother Church, think of Mystery Babylon, Mother of Harlots. If they don't bow to her then we'll just have them taken out. We'll, we'll just come in and, and take over ourselves. We go back to the TV show, The Event. Hmm. That's exactly what they were trying to do. They decided, since they can't work with us pesky humans, they're just going to come in and take over. And their goal was to take over, and they would take over the, the world, eliminate most of the humans. Where have, we, where have we heard that before? Eliminate most of the humans and claim this world for themselves. Now, the interesting thing about the event is that there were, there were two groups of aliens. They were all the same race, but there was, there was two groups of them. One of the groups we found out was still back on the home planet, way, way back, you know, out in the galaxy somewhere, um, and they were waiting to come uh, to the earth. There was another group that was sent before them that was, that was captured. And they were, they were thrown into prison up in, up in Alaska, way up uh, north. North, think about that for a minute. The Bible talks about how they're going to come out of the north country. They were put in a prison up north. Are you getting where we're going here? In a prison. And 66 years later, they were released out of their prison 
to facilitate the coming of the ones who were going to come from, from the stars. We, we have seen that over and over. In fact, the whole symbol of as above, so below points you to that. When you have Baphomet doing this, okay, he is pointing, he's making as above, so below. That's the idea and concept that, that you see in the event. Even when you look at the letters, E, V, E, you notice that the two E's are, are facing in opposite directions. That is an old Masonic uh, Rosicrucian uh, symbol of uh, like the two-headed eagle facing in opposite directions that shows you the fusion of opposites together in the same body in the event. Notice the advertisement poster for the event. A prison can't contain it. This idea of the pit and prison is biblical. The Bible says Jesus went to preach to spirits in Prison, the Bible teaches us that the pit, the bottomless pit, hell is the prison. The, the that sinned in the book of Jude are being reserved in chains of darkness in prison right now. But something's got to happen. It's going to let them, going to let them all out. It's going to release them. A prison can't contain the event. Um, and I told you this, this woman's image in this little subliminal picture here that you see, um, she's actually the, uh, the matriarch, the, uh, the, the head of, of all of the aliens. It's her, her name. She's got red hair, and she controls it like the queen bee, okay? She controls this hive. Think about bees. She controls this hive, and she is the queen, and she has red hair, and her name is... Sophia. Now, in the occult realm, the name Sophia, uh, you remember uh, from the Da Vinci Code, the woman who ends up being of the bloodline of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene in the Da Vinci Code, her name was Sophie. This concept of Greek wisdom, opposite of the wisdom of the scriptures, is actually, her name is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so here this TV show, The Event, we have all this subliminal ideas that are being perceived without people's awareness. They're being taught the mystery religion. They're being told the secret in a very subtle way. You watch all the episodes of this show and it leads you to the conclusion that they want you to make. Now, the real letters, I-N-R-Y, uh, Albert Pike. I, when I saw this, I remembered, I read this in Morals and Dogma. I know what this saying means. Let's break down this I-N-R-I very quickly. Here's what Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma. He said, to the, to the word I-N-R-I, inscribed on the crux ansata over the master's seat, many meanings have been assigned. Now, stop right here. Albert Pike is already telling you that in the Masonic Lodge, the worshipful master sits on a throne, and there is a cross, like a towel cross, with the letters I-N-R-I. He's going to allude to what it means. He says, the Christian initiate reverentially sees in it the initials of the inscription upon the cross on which Christ suffered. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Iodorum. The sages of antiquity connected it with one of the greatest secrets of nature, that of universal regeneration. They interpreted it thus, igne natura renovator integra, which means the entire nature is renovated by fire. I want you to think of the phoenix, okay? How the old world is going to die away and be burned up in the, and out of the ashes is going to rise a new a new world. Think of the 33 Chilean miners who were down in a prison in a pit. What was it that brought them out of the pit? It was the, the phoenix, okay? And, and continuing on, and he, Albert Pike says, and the Jesuits are charged with having applied to it this odious axiom, justum necare regis impios. Uh, we talked about what that means. The four letters, here, here it is right here. This is going to make it real simple. It's, it's the number four. The four letters are the initials of the Hebrew words that represent the four elements. Emim, the seas or water, Noir, fire, Rauk, the air, and Ebeshach, the dry earth. Earth, air, fire, and water. We have done several things on the Watchman video broadcast in the past about the elements and the four elements, elemental magic and what they mean. And I'm going to kind of go back over that very quickly. First of all, the religion of Wicca. Wicca is witchcraft. 
which of course the Bible says is a sin. God said, don't have witchcraft, don't have witches, don't listen to wizards, don't listen to uh, Harry Potter, don't listen to Gandalf, don't listen to anybody who is a wizard. Paul said to the Galatians about these brethren that, were, that came in unawares, he said, they bewitched you into believing a false gospel, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four of them, Four, four Gospels, they've removed you from the true Gospel, which is number four, to a, a false Gospel, which is also associated with the number four. In fact, four times in the King James Bible, the Apostle Paul referred to another Gospel, another Gospel, another Gospel, any other Gospel. Four times. Okay, so we have the elements, earth, air, and fire, and water. We have Wicca, which is a false Gospel, it's a false religion. They use what they call the elementals. Um, I want you to think about companies that are using brand names with elements or elementals. Even, even Christian literature publishers are now distributing literature for Sunday school, for Bible studies, calling, calling it elements or the elementals. This is none other. It's, see, it's, it's over here. You don't really know what that means. You're not, you're not catching it right off the bat. They're coming in subtly, in the peripheral, on the outside here. They're sneaking in without your awareness of it, right inside the church, okay? We were warned. We were told it was going to happen. But here is Wicca. Here is witchcraft. They, they operate, they, they use magic through the force, where have you heard that before, of, of, of the elements. They say, we're just simply taking the natural forces that are in nature and we're bringing them together because they had this idea that, and this is why witches use the pentagram. Remember the pentagram, it has five points. It represents what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will sit, uh, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay, Satan being God, and that's what the pentagram represents, and the witches, and they all say the same thing, that the pentagram represents the four elements, earth, air, which are opposites, earth, and air are opposites. Fire and water are opposites, like male and female, yin and yang. And these four opposites join together. You remember Captain Planet. They all join together to bring out of the earth this, this like savior that's going to save the planet. Uh, so here we have uh, earth, air, and fire, and water. To, to, when they join together, they're going to bring out of them something that's hidden down inside of them, something that's trapped in prison that needs to be released the hero inside of them we talked about last week and that is ether or spirit so the fifth is always going to rise up out of the four alchemy uses elemental magic or elemental principles uh, in taking this idea of of a base metal like lead and turning it into gold but real al alchemy has everything to do with taking humans and making gods out of them by releasing something that's going to bring them enlightenment. The alchemical symbol of the cross, uh, the, the crossbones and the skull basically tells you that same concept. Think about skull and crossbones. We'll show you that here in a minute. But the four alchemical symbols... For earth, air, fire, and water, you see them there at the bottom, represented by four women. Uh, earth, air, and fire, and water, that is I-N-R-I. You see it in the Masonic emblem of Jachin and Boaz, the two columns, the two pillars of the temple. And remember, from what we see in the scripture, Jachin is 23 cubits tall, Boaz is 23 cubits tall. They represent the 46 chromosomes where our DNA is stored. The way God made us, that's what Jachin and Boaz represent. And they say their secret is inside Jachin and Boaz. And you see on Jachin and Boaz, the alchemical symbols of earth and air, fire, and water. And notice in this symbol, they're all fusing in the center. They're all coming together in the center, at the center point. You get the point? Okay. Um, also in Masonic ideas, and you see this even in religious art, you see the four letters called the Tetragrammaton. Yod, He, 
va he. Now remember, there are four letters here. Okay, they associate with I N R I. They are associated with this idea of elemental magic. Yod he va he. You'd be surprised. You would be surprised at the number of religious beliefs that say if you s- recite the magic name of God, like yod he yod he va he, or I N R I, or any combination of that, that you're going to perform this wonderful magic and you're going to become a god. Okay. And you start to see this everywhere. By the way, this emblem, let me go back to this. This emblem here of the yod he vah this Masonic emblem. I want you to notice that it's in what we call the, the heart, the heart shape. It, and it's an up, upside down heart. Um, I'm going to show you why here in, in just a minute. But remember this idea of the, the pentagram. You have the four points represented by the, the arms and the legs. And then you have the fifth part of it, which is the head. Okay, and that represents something that is rising up out of the four that's going to give eternal life, it's going to give immortality, it's going to give illumination. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a method of, of, of transformation, of change. Change is definitely in the air. But here's, here's what it really points to, the four elements. Earth, air, remember they're opposites, and fire, and water and their opposites and they're they're building together to make this this god thing and i want you to think of it this way adenine thiamine guanine cytosine what are those that is the four base pairs that strand together or hook together your DNA. That's what I-N-R-I, or the four elements, or the yod he va he or any Masonic or occult symbol that has or associated with the number four, it's always going to point you to adenine thymine, which are opposites, but they come together, guanine cytosine, which are opposites, and they always come together in the human DNA. Remember what we've talked about earlier, especially last week. We talked about the Bible talking about, and we see it out in the, in, the, in, uh, in the church. We see it everywhere where they're talking about there's something in us, something in our DNA. It's in our DNA, and it's just going to come out of our DNA one of these days. We're learning something here. We're being told something by the world, but we're being given the truth by the scriptures that there is something inside of us. Paul referred to it as sin in Romans chapter 7. He said it dwells in him. And he calls it no good thing. It's actually bound up. Remember what the scriptures say about a child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And it's interesting that the heart, remember that symbol of the heart, the heart actually has four chambers corresponding to Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Look at the image of the heart. They're opposites. They do opposite things. One takes blood in and one puts the blood out. And yet it's in the heart of man. When you see religious images such as this image of Jesus who is pointing to his heart, the Virgin Mary pointing to her heart, um, and, of course, you see the symbol here of the three fingers up and the two fingers down. Uh, that is a symbol for as above, so below. When we look at the symbolism of the heart, let's understand what the Bible says about the heart of man. You know, Joel Osteen likes to say, everybody say, this is my Bible. It is. Uh, I am what it says I am. Uh, and that's true. Let's look at what the Bible says about the heart of man and what's inside of here. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what's contained in our heart people is desperate wickedness and above all things our heart is deceitful. Maybe this is why and we're going to get to this verse in a little bit. This is maybe this is why The Bible tells us that we need to be crucified with Christ. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Here is Jesus himself telling us what is inside the heart of man. Matthew 15, verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed 
evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And I want you to notice here, and I like to count things. Because there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that proceed here in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 18 and 19, that proceed out of the heart of man. Uh, evil thoughts, murder. Remember, remember, we're dealing with, we're dealing with trying to bring, we're dealing with thoughts. Uh, things that are in our mind without our awareness. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, things like that. Seven things listed here. But here's the interesting thing. In the parallel gospel of Mark, we actually have a list of more than seven things. Now, here, I, I want you to, I'm going to bring this together for you. I want you to think of what really is on the inside of us. Paul referred to it as sin, that no good thing that dwelleth in us, and all of these things. We know what's in our heart. It's an image of the man of sin himself that is residing literally in our flesh. It is no good thing. Thing, that spirit of Antichrist that is already working. You see, our flesh is always contrary to our spirit. Our flesh hates our spirit. The spirit, being in communion with God, hates our flesh. There is enmity, just like Jesus and the Antichrist. I'm telling you, what's in here, what's in my flesh, is no good thing. And I want you to notice that in Matthew, he said there were seven things in here. I want you to think of a beast that rises out of the sea. And uh, you remember in the symbolism of the human heart, there is actually, and remember what Jesus said, that he was going to spend three days and three nights where? In the heart, the heart of the earth, the fourth dimensional realm that is below our feet. That's where Jesus said he was going to be. And the heart, watch this now, is surrounded by a, by a, a sea, a saltwater thing called the pericardium. We actually have an ocean that surrounds our four-chamber heart, and most of the entire world is covered with the ocean, the salt water. It's the exact same thing. But here we have John, Revelation chapter 13, who sees a beast rising up out of the sea, and he says that he has seven heads. Well, I think those heads are called evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Remember, on his heads are the names of of blasphemy. Seven things here associating with the seven heads of the beast. But then in Mark chapter 7, we have the same story retold and a few more things are added to the list. Mark chapter 7 verse 21, for from, for from within, out of the heart, four chambers, four things, I-N-R-I, whatever you want to call it, proceed. Number one, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. You know what he said? He was teaching this in the context of, well, watch this now. He was, he was saying, he said, you Jews, you wash the bowls, you don't eat certain things because you say, if I eat that, that's going to defile me. And Jesus, our Lord, our chief apostle, the bishop of our souls, the shepherd told us, we're not defiled by what goes in our body. We're defiled by what comes out. See, the Jews, they were real particular. Oh, we can't eat that. That's got pork. Or, you know, that touched this. Or that's an unclean animal. We can't eat that. We won't defile this. And Jesus said, you're not being defiled by what you're putting in your mouth. You're being defiled by what's coming out of you. And isn't that the case with religious people? And I don't care what denomination it is. I don't care what breed it is. Um, I, 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 going through the airports and being in, in foreign countries, I saw a lot of Muslims. And you know how I knew they were Muslims? They had the dress on. They had the uniform on. They, they had the outward appearance and very, very cocky, arrogant, dressing their women up in everything but a, just a little, all you could see was their eyes. Very proud that they were the adornment of a Muslim on the outside. 
But on the inside, they were just nasty and corrupt and vile as everybody else is. Let me stop here for a minute. One of the things that I like to do is that as we look and see what's going on out here in the world, let's look here. Let's examine what's in our own hearts and let's be honest because I've gone through this list and I can say, yeah, I've had evil thoughts. Yeah, I've, I've had thoughts of adultery, fornication. I've, I've had thoughts of wanting to kill somebody. Yeah, I've thought about stealing things. I've thought about coveting things. I've had wicked thoughts, deceitful thoughts, lascivious thoughts, an evil eye, a blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. I, I, I have like every one of those in me. Every one in me. And I don't like them. I don't, I don't like them at all. I, I hate, I hate, I'm like Paul in Romans 7. I hate what's in me. It is no good thing. And see, these things are enumerated. In Matthew, we saw seven of them. Here in Mark, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen things here. All these things come from within and defile the man. And see, what happens is that they're in us, okay? And they won out. I want you to think of the beast. He's, he's in the prison. And he wants out. He wants, to, he wants to climb the ladder and get out. Incidentally, the York Rite of Freemasonry, their symbol is a ladder with 13 steps on it. Think about that for a minute. Because it's in Revelation 13 that we're told about the beast that rises up out of the sea. And he has on his head the, the, the names of blasphemy. And so here we have this idea. We have all of this in us. And all of this represents the beast, the Antichrist, and he wants out. And I don't like him. I don't like that he's living and dwelling in my flesh. I don't like it at all. And I definitely don't want him to come out. You see, I can't control what I have in my flesh, but I can control whether or not I let it out. You see, we may not be able to control all of the subliminal things that we perceive without our awareness. We may not be able to stop the subtlety of the serpent. But we can make a decision and a choice on what we do with it and whether or not the prison actually can keep it in there. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, here's what Jesus said. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, you've got, you've got that stuff in you. And here's Jesus, here's the Apostle Paul telling us, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Here's Christ up on the cross, and he's got the thorns on his head. He's got all that stuff going on. He's got, I mean, he's got that, uh, he is 33, he's got our sin on him. Here's Christ, and he's killing it, and he's getting his victory over his enemies in his death. This is how I am. This is how I want to be. I have all of these enemies here, and I don't like what's in here. I, I don't like the flesh that I have. I have all of these thoughts that Jesus said, and the truth of it is, you do too. You still have them. Don't let any preacher or any, any religious person or any psychiatrist tell you that you can just change all your thoughts and get that stuff out of your mind and never think that way anymore. Listen, it's bound inside your heart. It's there. And as long as this flesh lives, it's not going anywhere. But see, that's the key right there. It's got to die. This is why flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God's not going to let the Antichrist in heaven. Are you crazy? Okay? Crucified with Christ. Present your bodies a living 
sacrifice. Now, I'm not saying go out and kill yourself. I'm not saying we got Kool-Aid mixed up for everybody to drink. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying let death kill what's inside of you so that you can be free in Jesus Christ. I'm going to go back to the plain, the plain gospel. You're bound for hell. You're a sinner. Christ died for you. Do you want to live eternally in heaven or do you want to go to hell? And the choice is very, it's just two choices and it's very simple. If you want to go to heaven, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And now you have a choice to make. You want to follow Christ or do you want to follow this? I'm going to follow Christ. I hope you will too. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you the next time, the next Watchman video broadcast, the next Pure Bible Study, Pastor Mike Online. We'll see you somehow, some way. God bless you. Bye-bye.